Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to talk about a subject that I love, that is a group of animals uh, that I've worked with for over 10 years. And uh, to start with, I want to show uh, two images. One is, I don't know if you ever picked up a leaf from the ground and saw that you can see all the nerves around, but most plant tissue is not even here anymore, with a wood louse around it. And on the right, uh, we have an image from a meeting, a scientific meeting about wood lice, uh, with the word in several different languages. So we passed around from people to from different nationalities, and each person added how to say isopod or wood louse in their own language. So it's a very funny meeting, uh, maybe 70 people every three years, and it's a lot of fun. Well, the title Vida de Tatuzinho in Portuguese is related to the movie A Bug's Life that in Portuguese is Vida de Inseto. But if you look at the image here, uh, and if you remember the movie, not all the animals in the movie are actually insects. Because in English, we can use the term bug to more than just insects. So what does bug refer to? And how to best translate the title of this lecture? Would it be a wood louse's life, an isopod's life, maybe more technical, or a pill bug's life that sounds more like the original title of the movie, but it doesn't really refer to all the animals of this group. So I was looking for the definition of bug and I tried to focus on the zoological meaning. So not to annoy somebody on social media, not a listening device that can be planted in your house or a problem, in a computer program, but the biological zoological meaning. And here I brought two definitions. One, four different meanings for zoology. One, a general name applied to various insects belonging to Emiptera, an insect of the genus Simex, that is a bad bug. Another definition, one of various species of Coleoptera, that is the ladybug. In the previous image, we can see this is the ladybug. One of certain kinds of crustacea, as the sow bug, pill bug, bait bug, or safe bait bug. There's another definition that adds more things. It relates to an insect having mouth parts for piercing and sucking, so aphids or bad bugs or stink bugs, a second definition that talks about cockroaches, and a third that refers to many uh, invertebrates with many legs, such as spiders or centipedes. So, pretty much talking about arthropoda. This is the largest phylum that we have, and it has four living subphylum. One extinct one is the trilobites, that we can see here, some images. We have Chelicerata, that is scorpions and spiders. We have Myriapoda, the centipedes and millipedes, so the animals with 100 legs. Uh, we have Crustacea. Usually we think of crustacea and our images, a lobster, a shrimp, pretty much things we can eat, right? Seafood. And exapoda, that is the subphylum that includes the insects. But where are the wood lice here? The pill bugs, where do they fit? Well, they're actually crustaceans. As I mentioned, we think of lobsters, shrimps, and crabs when we talk about crustaceans, but this group also includes species like barnacles that are marine animals that attach themselves to boats, uh, to pillars, and to rocks, and 
of course, the terrestrial isopods, that is a group that has successfully colonized the terrestrial environment. When we talk about wood lice, everybody thinks about the pill bug. And here I brought a cartoon, uh, a comic strip, quick playing kickball with your brother. So we know about the ones that roll into a tight ball and we used to play with when we were kids. But not all wood lice actually have this ability of rolling into a tight ball. We have over 3,700 species of terrestrial isopods that are distributed from the coast up until deserts. So we have a lot of adaptation and the species varied in terms of color, in terms of size, morphology, shape, and strategies to colonize the environment. Here we can see this is the coastal one that can withstand submersion in water. Here, letter G, is the desert species called Emilepistus that actually makes a burrow, kind of a cave to live inside because of the adverse conditions from um, desert areas. And everything in between, including letter E, that is the one we probably played with when kids, Armadillidium vulgari. Here we can see different colors, different shapes, and in this one, probably you wouldn't really recognize these as isopods, as wood lice, because we do have a variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. Commonly, we can separate these animals into six different ecomorphological strategies based on how they avoid their predators. We have runners. So these animals have long legs, slim body, and they can run very fast. In Brazil, we have Atlantosia floridana as one species that runs. We have clingers, such as Porcellus cabet, that attaches itself to the substrate, so the predator doesn't have access to the soft ventral parts. And we have rollers, like Armadillidium, that roll into a tight ball, so the predator doesn't have access to the soft parts, and it rolls into crevices. So. It is a, a way of kind of fleeing away from danger. We also have some spiny forms, and uh, this is one of my favorite, I guess, is very colorful. It's usually small and this long spines. We have very small ones, usually lighter color, that live within small particles in the soil. And we also have some that have a mixed form that don't really fit in the other five categories, such as the desert species. Why are these animals so fascinating? Why do I love them so much? Well, when we observe nature, we can actually come up with things uh, to use in our lives. And uh, this is a suit that was inspired from Armadillidium vulgari, so the pill bug itself, the one that rolls into a ball. So you have the plates that they have a specific uh, attachment that allows mobility of the joints, such as the elbows. So you have protection, and doesn't matter how you move, you're still protected and mobile, so things are not exposed. Another thing is um, studying some aspects, specific aspects, not just the overall morphology, also can provide other inventions. So I like this, insects or arthropods did it first. Can engineers do better? I don't know if engineers can do better, but we can study what is there in the nature we can describe how are things, and then we can use that for biopolymers, for example. One of the things that can be used for this purpose 
is understanding the exoskeleton or the cuticle. What is the exoskeleton? This is a kind of an armor, something that protects the animals uh, from the environment, also allows communication and a lot of other functions. If we look, if we put these animals under a microscope, we can see it is not just one uniform thing. We actually have several layers with different characteristics. And here we can go deeper and deeper, going into a higher magnitude to see how this structure is. So we have a plywood structure. So this shifting disposition and lots of layers are stacked and uh, these are composed of fibers and you have things within. So all the organization provides some, um, some kind of a resistance. And we can use that. And if we look at uh, microscopy images, such as this one, we can see how the layers are stacked. And this is related to certain um, resistance to mechanic uh, weight or flexibility, like the animals that run, they need more flexible cuticle. And understanding and describing this allow us to create something similar. We can also see the structures that they have on the surface to allow communication with their environment. So this is a scintilla, is a structure that understands what is going on around them and gives the animal information about their surroundings. One species can have a surface like this. We can see here some curved structures on the surface, and we have this sensory structures here in the edge, some in the middle, and we have another species that have perpendicular structures that go very, very tall. And we don't see the curve structures on the surface. We see flat ones. Why are they different? Well, this is actually related to their environment. The species with the very tall sensory structures need space so they can occupy layers in the soil that actually have more space. The other one doesn't need all that much space, so it can migrate to the soil. Because of that, this species is more resistant to environmental fluctuations. So different strategies for different groups. This is... Um, histological image of the animals and we can see the species that I mentioned before. This is a clinger, this is a runner. You can see this is much bigger than this one. And here is a cut. So we can see the overlapping structure. Remember the armor with the overlapping parts? Well, here we can understand how they are overlapped, how they attach. We can see the ultra structure to make uh, biopolymers, for instance, of the bigger species and of the smaller species that I presented. So the layers and the proportions are different. And that's why this cuticle is tougher, more resistant than this one, but this one is more flexible. So using this knowledge, we can create a lot of things that have medical implications even. But if we have a rigid structure around the body, how do these animals grow? Well, they have to grow through molts. They have to change this exoskeleton. And crustaceans, they have a very specific way of molting. Usually they start with a rupture and then they start shedding. So removing this old exoskeleton 
up until they are free. And then what is left is an exuvia, the old exoskeleton. Well, it would be hard to defend yourself if you didn't have your, uh, your skeleton, right? So arthropods, they have a problem defending themselves when they need to shed theirs. So in order to grow, they need to change this. And here we can see a wood louse with half an exoskeleton that has molted. And they have to go to a safer place to be able to do this process. Otherwise, they are fragile. They can be crushed easily. They can be predated because they cannot run. They cannot hide, right? And we even have molds that are used for reproduction. So specific structures that just appear in one part of their life cycle. But the isopods are special even in their molting. Instead of shedding all the exoskeleton at once, they do that in two parts. They first shed the posterior part of the body and then the frontal part of the body. With that, they can recycle some ingredients from one part they reabsorb and they can deposit in the new exoskeleton that is hardening here. I don't know if you've ever seen one animal like that that has two different sizes. The back part of the body is bigger because this has already molted and now it's waiting to shed the front part of the exoskeleton. So we can see this different colors and we can see even different sizes. I brought a video uh, that I use at Portas Abertas just to show you the process. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the music, the song that I added as a background. Uh, if you can, uh, it's just an internal joke. So you can see they're protected by the exoskeleton. They need to shed this to grow. This process is the ecdysis. It occurs in two stages. They accumulate calcium before that, and they become fragile during the process. They start making these movements to stretch the body to be able to release it. And you can see the antenna here. They put it to the front. Sometimes they tilt their body. It's, uh, it's, it's funny to watch. And uh, at the same time, you just want to help them, you know? You want to get, you know, your tweezers and just like pull it out. But no, you cannot do that. You might get a part of the body still if you do that. So you just have to observe and uh, wait until they finally break free. But eventually they do. And then they start hardening the new exoskeleton and they are ready to continue uh, with their activities. So yeah, breaking free, it's not only for us. But a part of that, people usually ask me, okay, Camilla, but what is their importance? Uh, I don't like to talk a lot about importance because I think that things, animals, every species exists and it doesn't need to have a purpose for humans. But talking about their ecological role, they are detritivores. What does that mean? That means that they are not part of the green food web. They are part of the brown food web. So we have lots of animals living in the soil. The leaves of the trees fall and then animals need to break down those leaves and turn them into nutrients so that plants can grow again. And isopods do that. They have a similar role to worms. When the leaf falls, we have biotic, meaning living components that act in this transformation and recycling. So you have a green leaf or brown, depends on how it falls. 
and then you have some animals that pierce those and then you have animals that cut them a little bit more then others break them down even more until the leaf is pretty much pulverized so all of these animals kind of work in a chain and they allow the soil to form and then we have nutrients for our plants again so they're very important in an ecosystem they are even found in home composts so i don't know if you have a compost at, at home if you do that uh with your leftover vegetables and plants uh, but you can find them and i do have a lot of them in my house i actually picked them up for my master's project that was with biodegradable plastics these animals can be found in landfills in places that you have organic material being decomposed so biodegradable plastics can actually end up in these conditions as well. So for my masters, I tested what will happen when you put biodegradable plastics in places with wood lice. I used three different plastics, one made from starch, uh, one made from cellulose, and, oh, sorry, this is the cellulose one, and one from a bacteria reserve, that is the PHP. And I used a species, ran several experiments to see how much they would eat, if they would eat, and how they would help the disintegration. And in the end, I saw that they actually eat, especially the starch plastic, a little bit of the cellulose, it takes longer, and uh, they even help the decomposition of the plastic. So, yeah they can feed on biodegradable plastics as well. Uh, well, I have more things to tell you about wood lice, but maybe that's it for today. I know it's a lot of different information, um, but they are definitely fascinating and I could sp spend days and days and days talking about them for you guys. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much uh, and I hope you enjoyed it.